the discrete Fourier transform, or the DFT, is used for computer-based frequency domain analysis. Just like we've used the Fourier transform to analyze signals and systems in the frequency domain, that's typically a pencil and paper type or of analytical analysis. We use a DFT for analyzing things in the frequency domain with computers. The applications for the DFT are many and diverse, and I just listed a few here. There's the idea of spectral analysis, which amounts to, for example, finding periodicities in data. How often does something repeat? Uh, there's denoising, which we accomplish by throwing away frequency components that are associated with noise and keeping the larger frequency components associated with signals. Compression works much the same way. In fact, uh, JPEG uses the DFT. We keep the coefficients in the frequency domain that are associated with large components of what we're trying to represent, and we discard the smaller components. We can use the DFT to perform filtering on signals, and actually there's an algorithm that can compute convolution in a very numerically efficient manner called fast convolution. So if we're going to do analysis with a computer in the frequency domain, first of all, we have to have our signals in discrete time. And secondly, those signals have to have finite duration. So we'll use n here to represent the number of samples that we have available. If we have a finite number of samples, capital N, then the discrete time for a transform is as I've written here. Okay, x of e to the j omega is just a sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of x of n e to the minus j omega n. So I'm assuming that the signal is duration capital N starts at 0 and it ends at time n minus 1. Well, this looks like something we could compute, but the problem is that omega is still a continuous variable. So what we're going to do is we're going to sample this at certain values of omega so that we don't have to compute an infinite number of values here but we just compute a finite number. So we'll sample frequency at values omega k which is 2 pi divided by n times k. So we'll have a total of capital N samples so k ranges from 0 to n minus 1 and we'll define x bracket of k, because now we're talking about something that's a discrete valued independent variable, k, is going to be the DTFT evaluated at those particular frequencies. And we can write that expression down, and this is known as the DFT, or discrete Fourier transform. It's just a sum from n equals 0 to capital N minus 1 of x of n e to the minus j 2 pi over capital N times k times lowercase n. And those are a series of frequency domain values that correspond to samples of the DTFT. Well, it turns out that, and this is something we'll look at later, you can show that the inverse DFT, the IDFT, is just given by 1 over n, sum k equals 0 to capital N minus 1 xk, e to the j 2 pi over n times k times lowercase n. And as with all the Fourier representations we've looked at so far, in this case, we're representing the time domain signal x of n as a weighted combination of complex sinusoids. And those sinusoids have frequency 2 pi over n times k, and they have coefficients x of k divided by n. But if you look at this, this is computable now because in both cases we have discrete quantities and we have finite size sums that we're evaluating. Okay, so these are amenable to computer calculation. We have an example that I'm going to look at, a very simple signal here, where we have 1 from 0 to 3, and then 0 outside of that. We're going to look at the DFT for n equals 4. Well, if I just substitute into the definition for the DFT, I have then that x of k, is a sum from n equals 0 to 3, because 3 is 4 minus 1. And the value of the signal is 1 at all of those points. And then I'm going to multiply that by e to the minus j 2 pi over n, capital N, which is 4, times k times lowercase n. 
we can write out all four terms in this sum and they're quantities that are fairly easy to evaluate and uh, it turns out that when k equals zero all of these terms are one they add up to four when k is one two or three then these terms cancel each other exactly and when k is equal to one i have one here and then i have e to the minus j pi, which is minus 1, so those cancel. And then I have e to the minus j pi over 2 and e to the minus j 3 pi over 2. Again, those cancel. So the DFT of this signal is very straightforward. It's 4 at k equals 0, and it's 0 elsewhere. Now, I've calculated this by hand. Most of the time, we'll be calculating the DFT with the computer. Now, we said that the DFT was the samples of the DTFT. So let's see how that works out here. We're going to compute the DTFT for this signal, x of e to j omega, sum n equals 0 to 3, 1 times e to the minus j omega n. And if I use the formula for a finite geometric series, I can write this as 1 minus e to the minus j 4 omega divided by 1 minus e to the minus j omega. I can factor out e to the minus j 2 omega from the numerator factor out e to the minus j omega over 2 from the denominator and write this as a ratio of sine functions with an e to the minus j 3 omega divided by 2 phase factor out in front. Now these two things don't really look, the, the DFT that we computed in this expression here, this ratio of sines, don't really look like the same thing. But it turns out that if we evaluate the DFT, at these frequencies, multiples of pi over 2, because 2 pi over 4 is equal to pi over 2, that we indeed do obtain the same answer. So what I've shown here, down here, is we're going to evaluate the DFT at k times 2 pi over 4, and if I plug that in for omega, we get the expression on the right, and it turns out that when k is equal to 0, this expression takes a limiting form of 4. And when k equals 1, 2, or 3, the sine function has 0 crossings at 1, 2, and 3 in the numerator, and the denominator is non-zero, so I get exactly 0. And indeed, the, we see that samples of the DTFT give us exactly the DFT, and I can plot this here using MATLAB, and what I've shown in red are the samples of the DTFT, are the stems in red, which end up at 1, 0, 0, 0. And I've also shown then the, the DTFT, which is in blue. So the DFT is in red, the DTFT is in blue, and you can see this ratio of signs that we've expressed on the left-hand side over here. It follows this uh, oscillating type shape. This is actually just the magnitude, by the way, I'm not showing the phase. And that the samples capture the, the peak and then the zero crossings of the DTFT. As we conclude this particular presentation, I want to explore the consequences of sampling and frequency. Now you recall we've looked at what happens when you sample a continuous time signal and you sample it in time. And what happened is that when you sample in time, you create periodicity in frequency because you take the original signal spectrum and you replicate it at multiples of the sampling frequency. The frequency domain and time domain tend to be duals of one another, so it turns out we're going to see a similar effect. But let's look at it in a little more detail. So here's how we're going to develop this insight. I'm going to take x of e to the j omega, and I'm going to sketch that like this, and when I sample it at multiples of, in this case, we're going to pick some number of samples, capital M. I'm going to sample it at multiples of 2 pi over M and call that my DTFT. And we'll use the subscript notation here to indicate that this is a sampled signal. Okay, it's sampled in frequency, just like we used XS of T when we sampled in time. So I can represent this sampling process as taking the original DF, DTFT, x of e to the j omega, multiplying it by a train of impulses that are spaced by the sampling interval, 2 pi over m, and that is a representation for my sampled signal. So if I think about this as multiplication in the frequency domain, or I'm taking x of e to the j omega, multiplying by s 
e to j omega, where s is this impulse train, that corresponds to convolution in time. If I go back to the time domain and ask what is the signal s x sub s of n that has d f t x s of k, well, it's just the convolution of the original signal x of n with the discrete time Fourier transformer inverse, that is, of s of e to j omega. Now we can compute the inverse discrete time Fourier transform of s of e to j omega easily enough because it's just an impulse train and it turns out that the inverse discrete time Fourier transform is this infinite sum here of impulses. So as before, we have an impulse train in frequency, we get an impulse train in time, and these impulses are spaced by capital M. So they're spaced by 2 pi over m in frequency, they're spaced by m in time, and we have this inverse relationship that we've seen before. Well, the convolution of x of n with an impulse train is particularly easy. Each of these impulses takes the original signal and shifts it to some multiple of m. So the time domain signal xs of n corresponding to the dft xs of k which is derived from sampling the DTFT has this form. I've got an L equals zero term, which would be X of N, the original signal, plus shifted replicates of this. So I've sketched this out down here in the lower panel, and you can see that if I take some signal X of N, I've drawn three non-zero samples for simplicity, and in the, the DTFT perspective, X of N goes on forever with zero values. But when we sample, what happens is that I take my original signal, so this is my L equals zero term, and then I add to that a shifted signal that's located at various multiples of M. So this is the shifted version I get for L equals one, this is L equals two, and then over here we have L equals minus one. Okay, so what I've done when I sample in frequency, I end up getting replicates in time. Recall before, when we sampled in time, we ended up with replicates in frequency. So this dual property holds. Now sometimes we're gonna use a notation here for this periodic extension of the signal as putting n in double parentheses with a subscript m. And that notation means that we take the original signal x of n and we replicate it at multiples of m and add things up. So we get this kind of this periodic structure. So to summarize this, sampling in frequency causes replication in time, just like sampling in time causes replication in frequency. And if I have a signal x of n whose DTFT is x of e to the j omega, and I take samples of the DTFT, call that x s of k, and those samples are spaced by 2 pi over m, then DFT pair for x s of k is a time domain signal who is a sum of shifted replicates of the original signal. So if I want, once I do this sampling, I introduce this replicate process in the time domain. And so if I want to recover my original signal x of n from this replicated version, I have to have x of n be time limited to less than m values, otherwise these replicates would overlap. Okay, so to get back x of n, I can't have any of the replicates overlap. That would be a type of aliasing. So provided x of n has fewer than m values or equal to m values, then I can reconstruct or recover the original signal from the sampled DTFT. So this is sort of a sampling theorem, right? It says that we have to sample this sufficiently densely so that we can recover the signal. And our sampling interval is inversely related to the duration of the signal in time. Just like when we sampled signals in time, we saw that the sampling in interval was inversely related to the bandwidth of the signal. In the same argument, they couldn't overlap. The other observation here, as we conclude, is that by using an M point DFT, 
other words, taking M samples here and using an M point DFT, we get a time signal that is M periodic. Okay, this time signal repeats every M values. And that's going to play a role when we use the DFT for various tasks. So uh, we're going to look at a number of properties of the DFT and how to use the DFT to do various signal processing tasks. It turns out to be an extremely powerful computational tool.